Hello everyone and welcome to The Collective Arcana, a channel all about tabletop gaming. And today we're going to talk about why it might be finally time for you to switch to Pathfinder 2nd Edition. Hey everyone, I'm gonna do sort of a relaxed fit sort of thing here. Just sort of talk about Pathfinder 2nd Edition, the state that it's in right now. Um, it's been out for about a year and a half, uh, a little over 18 months right now. I think it's had a pretty crazy 18 months in terms of the content that they have managed to put out. And, uh, you know, you may have already looked into it early on. I know a lot of people uh, sort of looked at it while it was in playtest. And in playtest, I didn't love a lot of what I was seeing either. In fact, I've been a little bit candid in the past. And I'm going to be pretty candid here. When I first ordered the Pathfinder 2nd Edition uh, Core Rulebook, it was only to sort of review it for the channel, just to talk about it. At the time, I had been running homebrew games for years. It had been really my default game was ones that I'd invented. I, I'd, I'd built a few completely ground up. And while I really enjoyed running them, um, it was nice for me to have... Pathfinder First Edition as a backup game for so that I could give people a game that they could look up online, you know, research uh, about their classes. Because the wikis that I made for my homebrew stuff, while they were fine, they were not as in depth as anything that anyone made. So you know, once once you got in the grasp of it, like it was fine. But as far as introducing new players to it, especially veterans who had been playing for a long time, and then tell them, oh, I only I only run my my homebrew game that I made. Could be a tough sell, uh, so I really liked having Pathfinder First Edition as my backup. I started playing in Pathfinder 3.0, 3.5 days back in college, seems a million years ago, uh, and then I, I loved it. I, I had a lot of fun. Uh, fourth Edition was fine. I, 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 I like Fifth Edition, uh, but for me, 3.5 was it was what I you know grew up on. It was what I first learned about. What I really enjoyed. And so, you know, Pathfinder continued that. And I had not a lot of reason to look elsewhere. The core rulebook was plenty. There were, you know, a lot of other information online. Um, you know, friends would get, you know, source books for classes or character concepts they really wanted, whatever. But it was a very flexible game system, I felt, and I loved it. And so I never really saw me ever needing a new de facto game system, you know, fallback position, because for most of my friend group, we shared the mindset of wanting really maximized customization of our characters uh, and really loose sort of rules. So for us, my homebrew game was designed specifically to do those things, to not uh, lock you into too many large decisions, to keep it flexible, to have very flexible round action economy, things like that. A lot of concepts that I would eventually see in Pathfinder 2nd Edition, uh, to the point that uh, my friends and I really sort of, when we were uh, running through and, and reading it, we would just keep coming back to, oh yeah, hey, we, we had that, we did that. Oh, hey, there's that thing. Oh, look how they did this. Same idea, they did it most of the time much better <laughs> than we did, but you know, we were just a bunch of silly kids. So, but still, it was nice to see uh, so many ideas that we had had about the type of game that we wanted to see and then see it presented. So when I got that book and I first started looking through it, I was pretty blown away. Um, it made me feel good about a lot of the decisions that uh, I and my my playtest players had made. It also really showed me a lot of the things that could have been done better, of course. You know, again, they're, they're a full team, but it was mind-blowing to me to see so many of the things that I had felt represented so well and corrected and done in this game system from, from the modular sort of character creation where you're just like adding template on template to your character to the way that your ancestries and your classes and everything just can advance as you choose, as you see fit, the way that your skills are sort of bound, but uh, and you know the numbers don't get too crazy. And they really feel much more tied to your character's abilities than they do to any items or things like that. The, just so many aspects of it. So, you know, I, I bought this book expecting just to 
just to have it on my shelf to do a video about it sort of thing. And I quickly started to fall absolutely in love with it. My players did as well. Um, you know, so, well, some of them, I will say some of them, it, it took a sell. At the time we were playing Pathfinder first edition and I had a lot of new players who had never played before. So I didn't want to impose my homebrew on them. So we wanted to have something where, especially because they were across the country, all of them. So I didn't want to have something where I felt like it would work a lot better in person when I could say, oh, this is this mechanic, this is how it works. You know, I, I wasn't going to be there for them. I wasn't going to be able to tell them exactly what everything on their custom character sheet meant or things like that. So having a resource where they could look it up on YouTube or just Google it and figure out the information, uh, the, the core concepts of what they should be doing with their class, that was just more appealing. And there was a lot of content for Pathfinder First Edition. I say were, like it's in the past. It still exists. It's still out there. I still have my books. It's great. But it just, uh, you know, I, it did a whole lot of things that it did pretty much everything that I thought it would need to do. So that's what we were playing, and they really seemed to like it. Uh, you know, I had most of them were more familiar with uh, Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition because that's critical role. Most of them were only interested in the idea of playing tabletop games because of Critical Role. Uh, and that's one of the great things about it and about 5th edition is how accessible, how it's just a thing that you can point to that you can send people and get them hooked on 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 the hobby pretty easily. It's a very fun show to watch and it's a very great system for streaming because uh, it can do a good job of staying out of the way uh, and give you the tools that you need to run it without getting in the way of narrative and things like that. So, but when it came time to actually run a game for them, I wanted something that was a little bit wider in its scope, but I wanted them to be able to play whatever they wanted. And I wanted it to be a system that I knew that I could run in my sleep. And so that's why I went with Pathfinder First Edition. And I know that there are people who are thinking, how is uh, Pathfinder First Edition? How is Mathfinder? How is uh, you know Pathfinder easier to run than Fifth Edition D&D? The reality is that it just is for me. I had uh, the majority of it memorized. What I didn't have memorized, I had a complete enough understanding of the system to, you know, do whatever I needed to in the moment to get us moving on to the next to the next scene or whatever it may be. It was just about system mastery. Five E is great and wonderful in a lot of ways, um, but it just it wasn't the system that I had in mind that I wanted to play, and it's not a system that, you know, I feel like I can run in my sleep. My primary concern with 5th edition was just feeling like my players, if they wanted to do something, I might have to say no, because again, primarily my system mastery, I didn't know for sure how well I could homebrew that versus Pathfinder 1st edition. Um, for better or worse, you can homebrew anything because most likely anything you think of is not going to be stronger than something that someone can find in a book. It's a very rocket tag sort of a game. And that's what I told my players. I said, if there's something you really want to do, do it. And, you know, I can find the monsters to fight you. I can find the ways to adjust the rest of the party to get them on par with whatever ridiculous choices you decide to make. And especially when introducing players to tabletop gaming, uh, I don't like to tell them no. I like to tell them as I like to be able to say yes to them as many times as I can in terms of you know what their character concept is. Not necessarily the specifics of the abilities, but I definitely want them to be able to make the character that they want to make. And that's something I've, I just felt more confident in Pathfinder One E versus uh, Fifth Edition D and D. So let's fast forward again. Pathfinder Second Edition comes out. Again, I had not intended to run it. I just wanted to look through it. I really like Paizo as a company. I liked a lot of their policies and a lot of the ways that they handled things, their outlook. It was very inclusive, uh, you know, compared to, especially when they, you know, they first came out, they understood, you know, who they were when they made the game originally, and they worked really hard to become uh, really an entirely different company in terms of not necessarily intent. I think the intent was always good, but definitely in terms of execution of that intent. Um, and so they're very inclusive and they have a really great model and a really great uh, relationship with their community just a whole lot of things that i really liked about the company so so you know i figured support them since i'm not going to be buying a whole lot more uh pathfinder one ebooks anymore uh but you know support them check out their new content do a do a review it'll be great for people who want it uh, and then as i said as i was reading through it <clears throat> uh, i and some of my current and former players uh, were really just impressed with so many things about it i had mostly stayed away from the playtest 
I had, I would check in every couple of every few months really just to see you know what the the gist what the scuttlebutt was but I really was not actually reading any of the books or any of the hard rules myself I was just I was just getting a feel on forums and seeing what the general consensuses were what everyone was talking about how it was looking and I really was not terribly excited about it um you know there were a lot of things that that scared me the fact that uh, you know, the action economy changes uh, while I was using the uh, Unchained, the three action economy for Pathfinder 1E. Uh, some of the ways that they had described it sound a little strange to me. The fact that, you know, people were talking about shields were strange and, and odd and spellcasters this and just a whole lot of, you know, uh, people's impressions on the playtest. And to be completely honest, there were a lot of places when I was reading through the book that I was alarmed and concerned. Uh, and the homebrewer in me, the lifelong homebrewer, was looking at, and I had 14 pages in a notebook thereabouts. It might have actually gone up to tw about 20, but it was a whole lot of pages of just, nope, this has got to go. This doesn't work. What were they thinking here? This is crazy. And just a whole, whole, whole lot of notes. Uh, fun fact, you can see some of my early impressions uh, the videos, I, I left them up so that you can go and look at them. The I, I've done three videos so far on the Champion. I did the I did my, my hot take first impression. I did a little more time. I did another one after I'd had a little more time with it. And then uh, I finally did third video when we were going through our class breakdowns, uh, you know, part of that series. And I can tell you that uh, so Paladins were my favorite uh, maybe my second, tied between Paladin and Wizard, uh, two of my favorite classes to play all time. Um, they feature very heavily in my homebrew world, and I'm just a big fan of that concept of, you know, somebody who can wear their faith on the sleeve and how they interpret that faith into action and how they use that action to uphold those tenets of their faith to help people or sometimes harm people and those tough decisions that can arise uh, as any gm will tell you having uh, deities having players who are invested in a deity is a great way to get them hooked into a game and it's a great way to get some information about what values that uh, player or that character have and how you can exploit those and use those in your game and it really creates a lot of great plot hooks so i really like having them in my game and i really liked uh playing them myself. And so when I saw that, you know, they changed the name to Champion, and when I saw that, uh, I thought that was interesting. And then when I looked through it, I saw why. It's because it's a completely different class than you might be expecting if you're coming from uh, 3.0, Pathfinder 1E, or, uh, you know, D&D 5E. It's completely different. It's got different design goals. It's got a very different chassis. Um, the end result is a very similar character concept, which I love. I love that, you know, now that I'm on the other side of my uh, lack of understanding of the system early on, I love how close you get thematically to the Paladin, but how different it is mechanically. And just the way that they went through and they weren't afraid to, you know, tear up the foundations on that class. You know, they said the, with what they're doing with Cleric, and the way that they're having the uh, multiple doctrines, you know, the war priest, which is the traditional armored battle cleric, and then the cloistered cleric, who is a much more Final Fantasy white mage type of a class. You have this, you, you don't have as much room for this character who is just a slightly more martial version of a cleric, especially when they didn't want to have the... Uh, at least early on, we're seeing some new things with the Megan Summoner, but they didn't want to have as much nitty-gritty difference between spells and number of spells per day, spell lists, things like that. So rather than have the a whole bunch of half casters, they, in the case of the Paladin, the champion, they just removed traditional spell casting from it entirely. Uh, and that was scary to me, although the spells were never really something that I loved. I was I was much more of a a smitey uh type of a paladin lover but it was definitely a big change and uh you know so so they just they didn't feel the need for the paladin to fill that you know spell casting and the other thing is and they knew and it was something that we didn't really have uh, a clear picture of yet because the only archetypes that we had were multi-class 
Um, but so we didn't really have a firm understanding of how that multi-classing could work. Um, but we did have the ability to take a fighter or a champion and add a cleric dedication on them and very much get that feel of, you know, a more divinely powerful, magically gifted type of a holy warrior. So again, being able to, with how easy the multi-class system works and how you don't actually give up that much from your core class, you're just, you know, cherry picking abilities from another class. It just really made it super viable to create your own version of that paladin, uh, the old the old school version of the paladin. And so rather than just get rid of it, because honestly it wasn't really needed, they just created a whole new thing with it. and they created what is one of the first ever, in my opinion, successful attempts to make an engaging defensive character. Um, you know, you have we've had a lot of tanky classes in a lot of different game systems, but the champion with its reactions, with its unique tenants, and with the way that it can uh, get certain buffs and auras, you know, again, cherry pick the way that it wants to, you feel a lot more engaged when you're keeping your party alive versus you know, before when you just sort of felt like very much like any other class, you know, using buff spells and, uh, you know, your weapon and just not much different than, you know, a cleric, again, would do. But having that really high AC, having all those ways that you can protect your allies with your reaction, just perfect, great. And that's really, in you know, the kind of thing that I didn't see at first. I just saw, okay, the smite is nerfed. You know, why does the cleric get a better version of smite than the, you know, paladin does? You know, where is my my divine champion? I think the thing that I specifically said uh, in those videos was, you know, where is this character that's going to put the fear of God in its enemies? Because the champion isn't it. I was wrong. And so much of that comes from my lack of understanding of the system. You know, this is what I'm sort of going back to there. Um, but as my friends and I sort of sat with it and... You know, we waited. We had a swashbuckler in the party. We had a gunslinger in the party. We had a magus in the party, and we had a shifter in the party. The only thing we had in the party that worked was a multi-class rogue barbarian. It's the only thing we had that could actually translate into Pathfinder Second Edition. So, so moving over was not really an option for us. Um, you know, we looked at it and we figured, you know, there were ways that we could do it, but none of it was really going to work. But then the APG playtest came out, and it brought swashbuckler my other game that i was running had a witch so that was you know very much needed and so we sort of looked at it and said okay maybe we do need to you know look into at first i just wanted to sort of do a play test of it just to see how we liked it uh, for a couple of weeks and that's what i told him i said you know we'll go back to pathfinder 1e if we hate this um, but i do think that there's some fun stuff that i want to play with uh, so the Magus became a sorcerer with a fighter dedication, which didn't honestly work out great. We had to do some serious homebrewing. The swashbuckler worked great. The gunslinger, which was also a paladin combo, uh, became a paladin first with some ranger dedications. Um, and then it sort of flipped around to a ranger with a cleric dedication. And then eventually it would be a uh, ranger with both a champion and a cleric dedication. Um, and we actually found that uh, you know, that worked out fairly well. The swashbuckler was able to use the playtest swashbuckler. The witch was able to use the playtest witch. And uh, the shifter, uh, we sort of did a video um, with uh, the player, Anthony, talking about Jimmy and how we got there and how that worked out. And that was definitely some heavy lifting. But it's really what made us realize how flexible Pathfinder 2e was in terms of translating over. So what we saw was a character that did not exist in Pathfinder 2nd Edition, but when we broke it down, it was based partially on Druid and partially on uh, Monk already. And at the end of the day, we just we just sat down and we said, okay, what does Jimmy do? Jimmy is mobile, Jimmy hits a whole lot of times, and that's really the gist of what your character does. So we were able to look at the monk and say, hey, it does all of these things. Um, it's missing some of your uh, very homebrewed shifter abilities. Uh, you know, he had the ability to, instead of multiple forms, 
Uh, he basically took on an Eidolon form uh, from Rip from the Summoner, which also didn't exist yet. So he was really very much just a uh, just a monk that was, you know, we allowed him a fly speed and we allowed him to be uh, size large. And that's really all it took <laughs> um, as far as homebrewing. You know, he got to feel mobile. He got to, you know, continue his mauler feel of just, you know, shredding through enemies. What used to be natural attacks is now Monk's Flurry of Blows. Um, you know, either way, he's uh, reducing action economy and things like that. And it worked out very well. He had a lot of fun. And again, what we came back to was the way that when he decided to choose Monk, he didn't have to do any of the Monk things that didn't fit with what he wanted. But he was able to get a breath weapon feel with his key blast. He was able to get, um, you know, uh, his sort of, he was able to get his different types of natural attacks by taking different stances and things like that. So he was really able to recreate, um, you know, what was a big flying snake monster with arms and a unicorn horn by just choosing and selecting the individual monk abilities that he wanted that helped him meet that design goal. And from there, it was pretty straightforward. These conversion options with just the bare minimum, you know, just the first 16 classes and then, you know, not very many ancestries, we were able to really make it work and we were able to translate what felt like a lot of really crazy character concepts that there were not rules for yet in Pathfinder 2nd Edition into characters that worked in Pathfinder 2nd Edition. The only real casualty there was the Magus, but she went with Sorcerer and was very happy to have access to 9th level uh, and then 10th level spells. So she never really looked back. She still does okay taking pot shots with, uh, you know, ranged weapons and things like that, but she's much more spellcaster focused and she's, she's enjoying it. But, you know, the Magus is coming this year, so, uh, so that's pretty nice. So that's just our personal journey with converting to Pathfinder 2nd Edition. Uh, and it's by no means complete. You know, there were a lot of trials and tribulations along the way. But what I want to hammer home there is that even with the first six months of content, we were able to get our players and their characters translated over. Our Barbarian got a lot of cool new options that she was not going to have. Our Swashbuckler... Uh, stopped being just a reaction machine and actually got some really cool abilities and encouragement to do really silly things that while that encouragement was there, it was maybe not as exciting or as likely to cause the kind of trouble that it does, you know, fitting with the theme. So so all these characters, in my opinion, were able to translate their design goals very well. And once we started getting more and more used to the system, my, I would hear less and less my players talking about what they missed about the other, uh, the first edition versions of their characters, to the point that now I think most of my players, the swashbuckler does miss uh, being a reaction machine uh, sometimes, but I think he also understands that he's got a lot more things to do with his actual actions versus having a million reactions. And if you haven't played a swashbuckler in Pathfinder First Edition or you haven't GM'd for one, it is a slog. It takes a lot of time. They're very difficult to, to hit, and you have to sort of create enemies specifically to challenge the swashbuckler because martial enemies probably aren't going to be able to do it. So I personally love that change, that it's able to feel uh, like a you know, larger-than-life swashbuckler type of a character, without it being a slog on actions where even when it's not their turn, they're rolling, you know, several attacks and, and defense rolls, things like that. So that's, that's you know, it worked for us. Um, and you may be saying, well, hey, but there's so many more character options and classes in Pathfinder First Edition, or, you know, maybe even you think that, you know, D&D uh, 5e has so many options, um, you know, in terms of the characters that you can build. Um, I will say that you are correct on both fronts. Both of those games can make a whole lot of characters. And when I talk about those games, I'm specifically not talking about them to say one is better than the other. Uh, I'm just using them to illustrate that the two most popular alternatives to Pathfinder 2nd Edition, um, you know, if you're enjoying playing those games because you really enjoy those mechanics and things like that, great. 
This video is not to say that those games are bad or that you're wrong for playing them. They're to say that if you, this video is just to say that if you have been holding back on Pathfinder 2nd Edition until it had more content, until you were better able to replicate either your existing players or, you know, create the ideas of characters and player for players that, you know, don't exist yet. This is just to show you that uh, it's probably time to jump over and give it a try because there's a lot over here. So let's just start breaking down what you have access to. In the core rulebook, it shipped with 12 classes. Um, you know, if you're, that's pretty standard. That's what uh, 5e had. It's one more than Pathfinder 1e had. Uh, and it covered the bases very well. Instead of uh, Warlock with 5e, you got uh, the Alchemist. Um, and then, you know, Pathfinder 1e didn't have either in its core rulebook. But... Uh, I will say that just the nature of the way that Cloistered Cleric and uh, War Priest Cleric, those two doctrines, the way they completely change uh, your progression for many of your abilities and your proficiencies, really make those feel like two different classes. Specifically, they make you feel like two different Pathfinder 1E classes. The fact that even within that, you're still getting to you know choose your, uh, your domains and, and your deity and the different boons and everything that comes with those deities, you know, you're still getting to choose those outside of that choice of, you know, am I a frontline fighter or, uh, you know, am I stay in the back caster? So really, you're sort of getting 13 classes. Uh, and that's not even including, you know, of course, the different feats. And there's a lot of feats, and certain feats definitely play better into different types of types of builds. So, you know, but we'll get into that. We'll get into all that crazy customization in a moment. Just suffice to say that there's very nearly two classes within Cleric. There's also, if you're coming from Pathfinder First Edition, you may really like the Slayer class, which is a sort of combination of a rogue and a ranger. And the ranger actually has the big Slayer gimmick, the uh, which was the extra precision damage stolen from the rogue, built into its class as one of its uh, hunted prey options. So one of your three subclasses choices within Ranger is the Slayer. And so I'm going to go ahead and count the Slayers there too. So that's 14 uh, first edition Pathfinder classes, not 12, uh, if all you're doing is looking to convert. Then with the APG, we added four more classes. We added the Witch, we added the Oracle, we added the Swashbuckler, and the Investigator. So that puts us up to, what, 18 Technically 16, but functionally 18 Pathfinder First Edition classes ported over. And then the APG also came with a whole lot of new archetypes. Before, we just really had uh, a few organization archetypes in the uh, Lost Omens World Guide, but we also had our multi class archetypes within the core rulebook and, you know, with the APG for the four new classes. But the Advanced Players Guide added about 40 new archetypes. Of those, we saw two archetypes based on what were classes in 1st edition Pathfinder. We saw the Cavalier, which is the sort of mounted knight archetype type of a character. And we also saw the Vigilante. And these were fairly controversial decisions to put these in as archetypes. But let me go ahead and defend it really quickly. With both of those classes, the idea is that by keeping them as archetypes, as things that you're not having to you know, make as your default choice, you can apply them to any class. So if you really want to be a mounted leader type of a character, rather than be locked into I'm a Cavalier and then have to wait for and hope that they ported over the subclass of Cavalier that you really liked or, you know, whatever it may be, you just get to say, okay, my base class is Ranger, but I'm also a Cavalier, so I'm a ranged Cavalier. Or my base class is Fighter, but I'm going to take Cavalier, so now I'm just a super knight. I can do whatever I need to on horseback. Or you say my base class is champion, and now I am this, uh, you know, divine. Especially if you combine that with your divine ally for for a special magical horse. A lot of really fun combos there, and now you're just a shining beacon, knight in shining armor, charging into the battlefield with with pretty much everything going on for you. Uh, and then, you know, you still also have options to be things that really didn't show up as subclasses. You know, you could be a wizard cavalier, uh, you know, very fire emblemy with those mounted spellcasters, things that you just 
are not likely to see in other game systems unless they're specifically saying, hey, let's make a Fire Emblem. But by keeping that Cavalier loose, you, you have all these options that you never had before without having to have all this design space of these specific abilities because you, know, you can just add them to whatever specific abilities from a class that you want. The other one, and possibly an even better example of why this is a, uh, these classes as archetypes uh, are really great, is the Vigilante. So the Vigilante, if you're coming from not Pathfinder 1st Edition or you just never looked into it, the Vigilante is a class that uh, is a superhero, functionally, where you have two identities, and one of those identities is just sort of a boring, noble type of a person, and the other one is some sort of a heroic character with class features that you might expect. Now, what the Vigilante did was... Its initial choice was between like a fighter vigilante or a rogue vigilante. You know, so you could have like your uh, your Matt Murdock, your your street level you know punch guys, and then you could have your Batman, who is very much your like investigator, sneak around type of superhero. Now, what they did was with archetypes, which in first edition were just these sort of class specific subclasses that you could add on. They would come out in all these different books, very much how they work in fifth edition D anD D as well. If you're coming from there. And it would just be this thing that you could tack onto your character. So, you know, if you were a vigilante, you know, you had the base options, but then they would add options later, uh, you know, to be a spell casting type of a vigilante. And that was very similar to the warlock flavor where you would just have these sort of uh, innate bolts, but not a lot of actual spell casting, but you, you know, have these sort of magical strikes that you could do. Uh, there were also uh, one of the more... Uh, memorable for me at least is the magical girl where you were basically like Sailor Moon you know you get all these sort of uh wizardy magical powers um but it was all very like cutesy and the idea is that you know you just become this very Sailor Moon kawaii sort of a character you didn't have to of course but that was clearly the the intended flavor uh, but that but that shows the problem in this uh of the first edition version where if you wanted to be a certain type of vigilante, you had to wait until they released an archetype for that type of vigilante. Whereas by having the vigilante just be an archetype, you're not you're no longer saying, okay, I am this, uh, you know, this noble or whatever type of NPC type of a character, you know, not a heroic class character, and then I'm going to add these different types of vigilante on top of it to see what type of superhero I am you know, when I put on my mask and go out to fight. Instead, what we're seeing is a much more modular approach where you say, okay, when I'm in my vigilante mode, I'm going to be this class. And then the vigilante is actually just adding the social persona. So you don't have to wait until they release the perfect archetype for the type of vigilante you want to be. You're not limited to those early choices of just fighter or rogue, and you don't have to wait until Magical Girl comes out. You can say, I'm a sorcerer, I'm going to be, you know, this type of a sorcerer, and I'm going to be a vigilante as well. And so whenever I'm out fighting crime, I am this, you know, super pop, uh, silly character. Uh, but by day, I'm just this sort of straight-laced, you know, person about town. Or, you know, the, the, the polar opposite, you can say I'm going to be a, you know, a rogue, an assassin type, very Batman-esque. And then, you know, again... My vigilante archetype is just adding the social version, the Bruce Wayne, to my Batman. Uh, and it, it's just so much more versatile, in my opinion, than having a class that's built around it that requires you to multi-class to get the base versions or, you know, otherwise pick up feats and, and wait for subclasses to be released to create the exact superhero feel that you want. So that's just really the big strength to me of the way that the archetypes work. I understand that for a lot of people, the idea of your favorite class from Pathfinder 1E existing only as an archetype is probably a pretty scary, unfun thought to you. Um, but I will say that while I hope that's not the case with all of the classes that we've yet to see return, I do think that a great many of them could work very well as either uh, subclasses within existing classes or as archetypes that can be applied to multiples, especially those ones like the Cavalier and like the Vigilante that got a lot of their appeal by having numerous sub-archetypes really representing other play styles that people would latch onto and that had a lot of different popular options. And then the fact that, you know, again, that's just a fraction of the wide number of archetypes that we have available. Um, you know, there are a lot of things like they that get introduced in Adventure Paths. We have the Ghost Hunter that just recently got 
uh, release, and it's not quite like a multi-class occult spellcaster. It does get some spellcasting, but it's a much more utility, uh, much lower magic sort of a thing. I would liken it most similarly to like John Constantine, where John has those powers and abilities, but he doesn't necessarily, he's not really a wizard. You know, he couldn't go to Hogwarts necessarily, but that doesn't mean that he can't out maneuver a wizard and, and you know, more powerful spellcasters, especially you know, when, when you factor in rituals and things like that, which are completely separate and allow, again, for a pretty wide and, and wild range of characters who have magic without being spellcasters, um, which, again, I really like. But what's cool about that ghost hunter is you could be a much more martial focused ghost hunter. You could, of course, be the investigator type, uh, plays very well into that paranormal investigator. You could be more of a champion, you know, somebody who uses your divine magic to actually fight the creatures, but uses these occult measures and magics to get an edge on them or, you know, just to find them in the first place. And again, what I really like about these archetypes are that they are universal. Essentially, any class can have any archetype versus in uh, other versions of the uh, other editions, uh, you know, 1E, Pathfinder, 1st Edition, and uh, D&D 5E, versus those where you have to have an archetype specific to your class. You have to wait for these subclasses to come out. Um, you know, so what you would see a lot of times is a theme book would come out that would be all about, you know, ghosts, for example. And then it might have a subclass for hunting ghosts for every single class, or at least many classes. Um, instead, you don't have to wait for them to, you know, have a subclass to hunt ghosts specifically for your class. You just pick up the ghost hunting archetype and now you have that. It's a much more versatile, you get a whole lot more mileage out of these things versus, yeah, so, you know, just as an example, think about it this way. If the APG just added 40 conventional archetypes that just tack on to existing classes, you know, that are specific to those classes, then... Each class only is getting maybe, you know, two to three new subclasses on its own. But because they're all universal, that Advanced Player's Guide added 40 new types of champion and 40 new types of barbarian and 40 new types of cleric and 40 new types of whatever. And that's wild. That's a crazy amount of customization. And the fact that, again, the way the archetypes work you're not actually losing your core progression. So if you become a ghost hunting wizard, you're still going to get your full spell casting. You're going to get all those tools. You're still going to get your wizard subclass. So if you are, if you're the advanced familiar, you're still going to get that progressively cooler, cooler familiar as you go. If you're a staff specialist wizard, you're you're still going to be able to, you know, have that cool staff. You're not losing out the core of your class. You might lose out on some meta magic. You might lose out on, you know, some focus spells. But you're not really locked in. You can still go back and, and you know, grab things from either your class or your archetype as you need as something looks good to you. So if you don't see anything that you particularly like within your archetype at this level, grab a class video and vice versa. That's a huge, huge variety. Um, and it really does go a long way towards replicating a lot of uh, character concepts, not necessarily full classes, but character concepts that we haven't seen before. And in addition, this year we're going to be getting the Magus the Summoner, uh, the Gunslinger, and the Inventor. Uh, you can watch our playtest videos on those to get a feel for what those classes are like, but those are going to open up a whole lot of new options. The Summoner, in fact, has the Spiritualist sort of folded in because uh, it's a versatile spellcasting tradition class, which means that at first level you choose which of the magical traditions you use. Uh, so that's, you know, are you using divine magic? Are you using arcane magic? Are you using primal magic? Or are you using occult magic? Uh, for those coming from D&D uh, &D 5e, uh, is your spell list most similar to a cleric, to a wizard, to a bard, or to a druid? That's what you're doing. And as such, you know, you're getting a whole lot of smaller uh, class things to fit the theme of the tradition that you're choosing. So part of that is the occult, and the spiritualist was this sort of occult pet companion ghost sort of class. But the way that the modular way that Pathfinder Second Edition works by saying that the summoner is versatile in that way and can have other spell lists, they just are folding the spiritualist into the way that the summoner works. So we're getting two for one classes there. And that's what I'm talking about with build space and the variety is that there's so much more going on within each class than there were in other editions of the game. Not just with subclasses, but you know, with the feats that you choose. 
you can build a very different set of characters just because every every other level you're choosing class suites that are completely different and you're getting whole different subclasses. And then when you tack on the archetype, it really blows up. Speaking of summoner and that versatile spellcasting tradition, we're actually getting some other tradition. For those who don't know, the sorcerer already does this. So just within the base book, the sorcerer comes with uh, several different bloodlines that give them access to the different types of spellcasting. So, you know, you might be an angelic or a demonic sorcerer. Either way, you're going to be using divine spells instead of the traditional arcane spell list matching a wizard. Um, but even within that, even though you're not, you've now chosen a set spell list, you're also going to get some bonus spells based on your bloodline. So angels will get bonus spells that the demon bloodline does not. So even though they're the same spell list, that's where you're getting that extra variety, that those differences in spell access. You're also going to get different focus spell access. You're going to get different what they call blood magic, which is this sort of uh, little bonuses that you get whenever you cast spells fitting the theme of your bloodline to encourage you to use them more often and just give you a nice little edge when you do. So, you know, even within the Sorcerer, you've chosen four completely different spell lists. But even within those, you've got the specifics of, am I getting my divine magic from uh, an angelic ancestor or from a demonic ancestor? Uh, you know, with more added all the time. And again, that's not even counting the individual class feats that you could be picking within that class. And it's not even counting if you wanted to throw on an archetype. So the summoner will do that, the sorcerer already does that as a spontaneous caster, and the witch already does that as a prepared caster. So the witch is the same. Uh, it's very much like a wizard, except, you know, in that it's an intelligence-based prepared caster. But instead of, you know, being, but instead of having to take arcane, you get a you get a wide choice based on the patron who empowers you. Very similar to a warlock, but a much less martially focused warlock. Much less of a hybrid class, very straight on spellcaster. But with that same mysterious patron component. And your patron determines which types of spells that you get. But you also get to learn other lessons as you build your character. Uh, getting access to unique focus spells. Getting access to uh, additional spells on your spell list that other witches, other people with that spell list may not have. And of course, you're going to have your familiar and all the myriad options within your familiar. And then you're going to have all of your class feats as well. So just talking classes, there's a very narrow list of things from you know other editions of this game that you cannot functionally rebuild, at least in theme and play style. Individual abilities, you know, your mileage will, will vary, of course, but we're getting a wide, wide coverage here on the types of characters that you can build. And this is before we uh, even dive into the ancestries. So the core book shipped with six. The Lost Omens character guide added three more. Uh, and then the advanced player's guide added four more or five more. And then the uh, ancestry guide that just came out added six or seven more. And then we're going to get six more in the Mwangi Expanse book that's coming out. And we're going to get at least one more later in the year in the Guns and Gears playtest. That's a whole lot of ancestries. Uh, it's right around 30-ish base ancestries. But what's cool is each ancestry also has heritages. And this is something that you know we saw really for the first time later in Pathfinder 1e, but D&D uh, &D 5e does it as well. You're not just a dwarf, you're a mountain dwarf, you're a you know gold dwarf, whatever kind of dwarf you are. This adds a whole lot of variability to the types of characters. You know, you can have a whole party of uh, you know, one ancestry, you know, you're all from the same same region, same town, and you're setting out into the world, and it's okay, you're still going to be able to feel pretty different just with those heritages. That's going to go a step further in Pathfinder 2nd Edition, because as you level up every so many levels, you also get an ancestry feat to further develop aspects of your ancestry that are important to you. Most ancestries will have a wide mix, you know, whether they are, you know, martial, spellcasting, utility, whatever it may be. So there's going to be something for every type of base class, and as such, there's going to be a whole lot of variation there in terms of, you know, what does my elf do that your elf might not be able to do, even though we are, you know, very similar uh, ancestr ancestrally speaking, you know, from the same, same stock, whatever, we still get to have all these wide variations. Uh, even if, you know, you're both, for example, even if you're both snow elves, because you're not locked in to all of your feats after you've chosen your heritage, you can still be wildly different in the ways that your ancestry expresses itself in your character. 
This is also represented by the free ancestry or the, the free ability boost that ancestries get, you know, so that, yes, elves might typically be a little more dexterous, for example, um, but they also have a free boost that they can put wherever they want, very similar to how, you know, humans always were in previous games. Uh, every class has a little, or every ancestry has a little bit of that versatility now. But on top of these ancestries and these heritages, uh, there are a number, about 15-ish now, what they call versatile heritages. These versatile heritages are things that might exist from uh, not necessarily immediate, you know, it might not be you know, your mother and father type of a thing. Uh, it could be something way further back in your uh, people's history, in your particular bloodline, very much like a sorcerer, but it can manifest at random. So this is where tieflings and asimar are, you know, they should be pretty familiar to everybody from other systems. But what's cool is in most other systems, it's assumed if you're a tiefling or an Asimar, you're probably human or at least very human looking. And, you know, so you're just half human, half demon sort of a thing. In this, you can add a tiefling versatile heritage to any base ancestry. You can be a lizard folk tiefling. You could be a dwarf tiefling. So you don't have to be, so even within, you know, tieflings, you can have a whole party that are all tieflings and they're different different size categories, completely different ability sets, uh, just a massive wide variety there. And, you know, in addition to tiefling, I mean, we have, you know, things like half vampires, the Dampir, we have, you know, Asimar, of course, we have, uh, uh, we have people from the Plane of Shadow, we have, we have genie kin, you know, which are very much filling your Genasi roles from 5th edition, where you can just take whatever ancestry you are, add a sort of elemental lean to them, you know, give some, some unique history and some cool flavor and some really neat new abilities as well. And again, there are 13 of these, and humans actually have uh, two more in half-orc and half-elf, uh, which just sort of allows them to take feats from the orc and elf. And it says in the court rulebook that if you want to, you can allow anyone to take these half-orc and half-elf versatile heritages, and I recommend you do it. I mean, you know, it's a lot of fun to have. Uh, one of my players actually went with a half-orc, half-elf uh, combined, so they did elf base with a half orc on top. So they did elf base with a half orc on top, turned him into this very lithe but still really tough sort of a character with this really interesting, you know, background of how you know how they how they came to be this you know pretty unlikely combination. You know what those family reunions are like, that sort of thing. Then you can just you know to to really get it down to the very bottom, you've also got all these backgrounds as well, and there's couple hundred of them at this point, you know, each each adding, you know, ability scores, uh, skill increases, and skill feats. Uh, and what I'm getting at here is that between all of these variations, between your ancestry, your heritage or versatile heritage, your character's background, your character's class, your character's subclass, uh, an archetype that you may add on, and then the number of feats that you might be choosing from any of those locations at any given level, uh, it really opens up a huge, huge variety of character builds and options. I don't think that if you've been waiting for Pathfinder 2nd Edition to have enough content to port your game over or meet the creative needs of your players, I don't think that's a valid reason to wait anymore. Again, I'm not saying that you have to give up your game. If you're enjoying your game over here and you like these mechanics and you just see no reason to switch, by all means, there's so much room in this tabletop community. I would never tell you what game you should play. All I'm saying is if you've been waiting on switching to Pathfinder 2nd Edition for this specific reason, the wait is over. We're going to have effectively about 25 different classes by the end of the year if you factor in you know, the way that classes from 1E have been ported over on top of the 20 actual existing classes that we'll have. We're going to have 30 ancestries. We're going to have 15 versatile heritages. There's nothing you can't build, at least in terms of flavor and roughly translated mechanics. And listen, if this sounds really daunting to you, if this sounds like a whole lot of craziness to keep track of, it can be, but it doesn't have to be. It can be extremely simple to build your character. You can say, I want to be an elf ranger, follow the ABCs, you have an elf ranger, you're good to go. You can, and at any given time, you're not choosing from several things all at once. You know, when I'm talking about your ancestry, your heritage, your class, your archetype, your background, all that. You know, at character creation, you're going to do ancestry, heritage, uh, background, and class. That's 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 the end of really your choices. 
every level you're going to get one, maybe two feats, and those feats are going to come from one, maybe two sources. So, you know, you're going to be taking a class feat or an archetype feat, you're going to be taking an ancestry or heritage feat, or you're going to be getting skill feats or occasionally general feats, which are just things like toughness, things that have nothing to do with your class or your ancestry that are just specific to, you know, the way that your character uh, has evolved within the world. And the game is going to tell you at every level what your options are, where you can choose them, choose from. And as you get higher level, it's going to open up more and more because you can always go back and take lower level feats, but you can never take higher level feats. So your options at each level are going to grow steadily, but at a manageable rate. So don't be intimidated by all these options. Again, uh, as we sort of said in the Don't Quit Pathfinder 2nd Edition video, you can make your character as simple as you want and you will work fine. There is a very real amount of guaranteed competency within the classes. As long as you're keeping your key ability stat for your class, you know, on par, on level, keeping that as high as you can, you really cannot make a character that does not function. You cannot make a character that will not be able to contribute to combat every combat. Really, all these specifics are just determining how you interact, how you do those things, and sometimes how many other things you can do. That's really what it's about. You're not going to be able to mess up your core thing, really, but you're also not really going to be able to boost that core thing up. You're not going to be able to be incredibly exceptional in one area. You can have certain wide areas where you have a lot of options, or you can have a few options for an even wider section. So you can choose how narrow your focus is, but at the end of the day, your character can really only be so good at certain things and so bad at certain things. Pathfinder 2nd Edition did a great job of keeping that here, and that's why, you know, when we talk about optimization in Pathfinder 2nd Edition, uh, which we're going to do a whole, whole video on, um, it is not so much you wanting to stack higher and higher, it's more about you wanting to widen your scope with your character. A truly optimized Pathfinder 2nd Edition character is going to have options no matter what scenario they're in, rather than have a lot of options within specific scenarios. I know this was a much longer uh, video than normal, but I just had a lot that I wanted to cover. I wanted to illustrate how many tools, how many options are out there for players and GMs to create uh, interesting characters and you know interesting worlds as well. You know based on which of these options you allow or disallow in your world. Uh, there's so many tools here, and there's a lot of things to play with. So if you, again, have been waiting for there to be more options in Pathfinder 2nd Edition, if you felt like, oh, I have so many things in front of me in this other game that I'm playing, I like the way that Pathfinder 2 looks, I like the idea of this three-action economy, I like these modular character concepts, I like you know, the way that I, I've heard that it's very balanced, things like that. If you're enticed by all these other things, and you've just been waiting because you don't think that you can make the characters that you want to make, you can, and it's only going to get wider and wider as we go. For only being out for less than two years, we have an insane amount of con content, and while they're slowing down, you know, they've got their core in place, they don't want to keep expanding at the same rate in terms of classes and things like that. That does not mean that we're going to stop seeing things like new archetypes, you know, universal archetypes, subclasses, spells, we're getting a whole lot of ancestries this year, for example. But again, you don't have to be intimidated by those options either, because you can make your character as simple as you want them to be. So that's it. That's my argument for switching to Pathfinder 2nd Edition. Do you agree with me? Do you think that there's still too much missing? Definitely down in the comments, you know, let, it, let me know. Or even better, come hang out in our Discord. Uh, you know, I'm pretty active on there. We've got a lot of great people in there who... Uh, I feel have a better than average for the community grasp on the mechanics of Pathfinder 2nd Edition and how versatile and unique and uh, really powerful that modular system is. Uh, you know, so definitely swing by. If there's a class or a character concept that you don't feel you can make, come by, talk to us. I can almost promise that by the end of, you know, a few posts from some of our great people over in the, there in that Discord, you are going to realize that your character concept is completely doable and will be really fun in Pathfinder 2nd Edition. And that is a challenge. Come over to our Discord. Try to make a, try to come up with a character concept that we can't help you build. Thanks for sticking around through this whole video. I hope I've, you know, changed your mind a little bit about, you know, viability of switching to Pathfinder 2nd Edition. You know, again, keep playing your games that you're playing. There's so much room in this hobby. I don't want to tell you not to do something if you're having fun. But if you're curious and you've had these roadblocks, Hopefully I've removed some of them for you. Thanks so much for watching. Welcome to the collective. We'll see you next time. Bye.